Good morning, everyone. Hey, there was something I was going to announce a couple weeks ago uh, when it was Wade's last Sunday here. My brother-in-law, Wade, who is playing acoustic guitar, has moved my sister to Kelso to be closer to their kids, is what they told me. But now that I'm thinking about that, they couldn't wait for their kids to move out. So I'm thinking it's actually to be closer to their grandkids, <laughs> which I can totally relate to. And I see a lot of heads going like this, yeah. So um, anyhow, uh, Wade, if you're watching online, we miss you and God bless you. Let's stand and worship God this morning, okay? Good morning, Dayton Christian Church. Oh, it is so good to be in worship with you today. You know, do me a favor. Uh, find in your Bible, whether you've got one that opens or, or one that's on your phone or tablet, find in your Bible 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Just take a few moments, navigate there with me. Because, you know, the first box to check on our next steps on this connection card is speak out loud, 2 Corinthians 5.17. And I thought, why don't we just do that right here as we open up this service? So turn on over to 2 Corinthians 5.17. And while you're doing that, speaking to the connection card, 
boy, we want you to fill this out. Let us know that you're here today. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know what next steps you want to take. Maybe it's time to start that relationship with Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, or to follow all the way to the end by being baptized. Maybe it's just this, that you want to join the small groups. We've got our small groups posted as you walked into the sanctuary today. Uh, We posted when the groups are meeting and where. And the first group that's meeting is this week at the Sturm's on Thursday, and then the rest of the groups are going to be meeting uh, the following week. And it's not too late. If you saw that roster and thought, oh, I missed the boat, it's too late. Nope, it's never too late. Check that box. Let us know what day, and we will get you in that small group. And, And let me just make clear, small groups are for everyone, and they are so important. We grow in our faith in small groups. We experience transformation in small groups. It really is a crucial part of our walk with Christ. And we have child care available. We want to remove every hurdle there may be for you to be in a small group. And if you've been in small group before, I don't have to tell you or sell you on anything. You know. But I will warn you, this small group season is unlike any we've done. It is completely different and hopefully in a good way, right? So maybe that just uh, teases a few things that you're excited about. But yes, please check that box to join a small group. Let us know the day, time, and we will get you into one, and it is not too late. So hopefully you found yourself at 2 Corinthians 5.17, and whatever translation you have, let's read this together out loud. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Amen. Isn't that awesome? We are new creations in Christ, and you can check that box off of your next steps, and let's just make that the first box we check, and let's continue in worship as we, the new creation in Christ, worships our awesome Savior and Lord Jesus. We're reading from Psalms 40 through 3, uh, 40 verse 3. He put a song in my mouth, a hymn of the praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. You stand and worship with us again.
Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. Lord, maker of heaven and earth, we find all our hope in Him, keeper of our hearts, lover of every soul, He's our Father and our friend. I will fall on my knees to worship and adore. I will lift my eyes to the Lord. I will stand on. Covers us with grace. He never slumbers or sleeps. He is all we'll ever need. I will lift my eyes to the Lord. I will fall on my knees to worship and you we love you lord we praise you and we adore we worship you we love you lord we praise you and we adore i will lift my eyes to the lord i will fall on my knees to worship and I I will stand on his truth forevermore. Lift my eyes to the Lord. I will fall on my knees to worship and adore. I will lift my eyes to the Lord. I will stand on his truth forevermore. Isaiah 65, 7, 17 through 18. See, I will create new heavens and new, and new earth. The formal things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of nations. Say, 
Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, I'll fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light in, let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus. Shine the light in, let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave sing that again savior he can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. And I meant please on that too. I just didn't have time to get it in there on beat. So thank you for singing it again. It's time for all kindergarten through third grade kids to go meet with your teacher in the foyer. Have fun in class. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy
It has often been said that the last seven words of the dying church are these. We've never done it like that before. Some of you may have heard that. But I say to you this morning, the first four words of the dying church are these. Come as you are. Come as you are. Now, immediately, some of you are deeply offended because you've probably said those words before. And I think you're in great company because, you know what? I've said those words before. I've said those words in describing churches that I've been to and been a part of and a member of and churches that I've pastored. I've probably, at some point in the last three years, even said that those words in describing and, and encouraging someone to come to Dayton Christian Church. Come as you are. Exactly as you are, we just, we want you here. And you might be, if not offended, puzzled because that is usually such an inviting approach that we take with Christianity and with the Christian faith. We want people to feel comfortable. We don't want people to feel like church is uppity or self-righteous or any of those things. We want to promote this idea that, that we, Jesus' church, will meet people right where they are. So it just would make sense to say something like, come as you are. But you see, the problem is if we start the conversation of someone's faith with come as you are and inevitably end their journey with, hey, we've never done it like that before, then essentially what we are promoting is complacency. Come and be a part of an organization. Come and be a part of a club. Come and be a part of an exercise in just you never actually become more than who you are, what you are. And, and the thing is, if we were really honest, a lot of Christians actually feel that way. And if you have ever felt like that, you're also in great company because Christians in the new experience of the church, the first century church, had to have been feeling that way at times. More on that in a little bit. In fact, turn over to 2 Corinthians 5, and we'll see Paul teach on this exact thing. But as you turn over there, I wanted to share something that just is so revealing about us as human beings. In 2023, so just last year, two studies, two independent studies were conducted, and these were the findings. More than half of people surveyed were afraid of saying yes to something new. And of those who were afraid of saying yes, 35% were convinced they missed out on something as a result. So that was study number one. But study number two was this. A majority of people, when asked, would say yes if they were asked to help with a favor. And I, I just find those, those two truths, at least as far as those studies kind of brought things to bear, I just find that really fascinating about us as human beings. Because on the one hand, we are really afraid at times of the new. We are really afraid of experiencing something new. Even though we know down deep this new thing could be really great and could really be life-changing or at least just fun. 
an amazing experience, we're a little hesitant on saying yes. And yet, at the exact same time, there's something within us that wants to say yes, even if it's to something hard like, will you help me move or will you take me to the airport? So how can these two things be true at the same time, that there is this like fear, at least more than half of us have, of saying yes to experiencing something new, and yet there's this longing to be a part of something, even if that something is, is hard, even if that something is we would categorize as a favor. Well, in 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul is writing to this church community, and one of the things that I love about the Corinthian church is they're all shades of just messed up, broken. Uh, some theologians have called the Corinthian church, uh, or, or at least Corinth, as like the Vegas of its day. I'm not sure if it was that fun, but it was certainly that messed up. There's a lot of crazy things that were going on there. I mean, if you ever have the opportunity to read 1 Corinthians, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And, and we know even though we have two letters of Paul's in uh, our New Testament, we know that he wrote at least four letters to this church. So there were many, many opportunities that presented themselves where Paul had to get in the mix and try to help this church with some of the issues that they were going through. And one of the biggest issues was this church in particular would find itself kind of mired in complacency. And so in the midst of this, Paul reminds them of this just really incredible, life-changing principle, and he nails it in verse 14. Look there with me. It says, for Christ's love compels us. Christ's love compels us. It's, it's the motivation for everything. It moves us forward because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore, all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Paul is speaking to a church, he might as well be speaking to, to many churches throughout history that often find themselves kind of stuck in complacency, stuck in neutral, and he reminds them, he says, look, the motivator for who we are and what we do is plain, it's clear, it's Christ's love, and we know that because it's Jesus' love that brought him to the cross. Jesus died on the cross for all sins, for all time, for this one very important thing. God loves you, he's crazy about you. He's crazy about you. You are his creation. He made you and he formed you and he died for you to win you from sin, to win you from a life that's unfulfilling, to win you from a life that is complacent and stuck in neutral. God doesn't want to leave you how you are. He has no desire for that. God's whole aim is for you to be new. God's whole aim is for you to experience in your life being a new creation in Jesus. So why would we ever say to people, hey, come as you are. Come as you are. Well, yeah, we'll just accept anyone no matter what's going on in your life. Because that's not what God's message is. And four times in the Gospel of John, we hear over and over and over again, Jesus say to people, come and see. In other words, come and experience, come and observe, come and be a part of what God is doing through me. See, God doesn't want us to stay in neutral. God doesn't want us to feel stuck where we are. God doesn't want us to have an attitude like this. Uh, I've always had an anger problem. I've always spent too much. 
I've always looked at women with a lustful eye that way. I just have always been that way. You know, that's just who I am. It's impossible to read what we just read. It is impossible to see what Paul is teaching clearly. It's impossible to reconcile those two things together. And in fact, that is not what God has given us. God has given us the opportunity to really, truly be new and to say yes to being new. And how did he make that possible? He died on the cross. Jesus Christ died so that you and I can truly live. That's the message and ministry of Jesus as we experience it in the Gospels and as Paul is now reminding and teaching to this church. This isn't the first time they've heard this. Not by a long shot. This is a church that Paul actually preached in and helped plant. They would have heard this before. They just needed to be reminded of that. And guess what? Christians need to be reminded of this too. Because it's easy for us to get stuck. It's easy for us to be in that camp, that study, where we're like, oh, I don't know if we can say yes to something that's new. I don't know if I can say yes to changing who I am. I don't know if I can say yes to the idea that God actually wants to change me and make me a better version. In fact, realize the potential that he created me in the first place. No, I, I think the reason why we say to people as Christians, ah, come as you are, is we want to be let, let off the hook as well. We want to stay as we are. And Paul, his whole mentality here is why? Why would anybody want to stay as they were? How would anybody want to continue to regard others and Jesus with a worldly frame of mind? And that's not to get in your crawl and offend you and, and, and discourage you. It's to shake the doldrums of complacency out of you. That, that's really where Paul is writing here. And I think that challenges for us even today. Do we really, truly embrace our faith as something that renews us and can actually make us better? Is being better, is being new, is, is change really worth it? Well, if we believe that, then we have this ministry of reconciliation. And Paul even describes it, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. So the awesome thing about the grace of, of God as we experience it in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is it's never meant to just like be information that goes in and goes, oh, wow, I'm saved and it's great. It's all meant to compel us and to move us and propel us to something through the motivation of God's love to be a part of something beautiful in his wor world. And that beautiful thing is reconciling others. We are therefore, verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I love that. God renews people and calls them to this work of reconciliation in the church so that we might be ambassadors of his work, namely so that we go to others in our community, in our family, in our workplaces, in our schools, everywhere we do life, and we become the bridge, we become the agent, we become the diplomat, we become the person, the key individual that announces to the world and the people in it, hey, change is possible, being made new is possible, being born again is possible, being truly saved and changed in the love of Jesus is possible. And that's through you. Every single one of us who have found life in Jesus' name. You know what I love about that word there, the, an ambassador, I love that word, that we're ambassadors of Jesus. An ambassador is the most high-ranking official representing one country to the, to the next. It's the most high-ranking official. 
And I don't know about you, but in the, in the grand scheme of who God is, this word shouldn't fit me. How could I ever consider myself high-ranking for anything? My sins, my problems, my hang-ups, those things that need to change in me, those are the very same things that put Jesus on the cross. And yet God's love sees through all of that and reconciles me to him so that on the other side of that experience, as Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I now am the perfect person to represent God to someone who doesn't know him. And not just me, not just Josh Vi, but you, every single one of you that have been baptized and have found life in his name. You are a new you. That's what Paul is saying. You're a new you. You're not like you were before. Before you had that worldly mindset, that's how you saw people. And so you saw everybody's hangups. You know, you saw how you had an anger problem, but boy, you really saw how other people had anger problems. You realized how maybe you had lust in your life, but man, you really, see, it's always easier for us somehow to see what other people are doing even worse than us. We've been noticing that in our kids lately, you know, they're two and four, and uh, Zoe is constantly telling us when Joe's pulling her hair and uh, like he'll slap he slapped me this morning when I was trying to wake him up for church. I mean, that boy is a little bit surly every now and again. So he's really doing these things. But here's what she doesn't say. And I caught her this week. She like gets in his face and like sticks her tongue out at him or wags her finger in his face. And so finally I was like, Zoe, what do you expect? What do you expect? Yeah, one behavior is not right, but it's so easy, as Jesus said, to look at the splinter in someone's eye when we got a big old log sticking out of our own. But see, when we embrace our status as new creations in Christ, as we experience the renewed mindset in the grace of Jesus, guess what else changes? We no longer see people as jerks and angry and difficult to work with, even though, they very may, uh, ever, even though they very may well be those things. But just as God saw potential in us to renew us and to change us, guess what? We now see that in others. And that's one of the most incredible things about being made new in Jesus. In other words, being made new in Jesus doesn't make Josh Vi cooler and it doesn't, but it does give me a perspective of grace and hope, the same that Jesus had, that love that compelled him to the cross. And with that kind of change in mind, I can now say to others, not come as you are, but come and be changed. Come and let go of that anger. No, come and let go of that greed. Come and let go of that you know, culture that just covets and just always seems to want more and more and more and never be satisfied. See, I want to tell people more than just the fact that God sees us where we are and died for us while we were objects of wrath. I, I, it's definitely part of the message. But I want people to know that you're being invited to a life and a relationship, a reconciliation with the God of the universe that is never going to leave you where you are. What could this life look like? Well, in a different letter to a different church, but a church that's probably dealing with very much the same things, Colossians chapter 3. Join me there. It's almost as if Paul is, is continuing this conversation. What would it really mean to actually live, to actually do the things that an ambassador of Jesus would do. Well, he writes this, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, 
the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on what? The new self. You're a new you, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And, and I don't want to misrepresent something. What, what Paul is encouraging, challenging, teaching, motivating us to do here, this is hard. This is hard stuff. These are hard lists to tackle. But it's possible in Jesus. And the underlining foundation is simply this. If Jesus Christ could die on the cross for all sin and then literally tell death no and raise from the grave, if that kind of power is available and happened, then yes, those of us who have anger issues, we can get a handle on that. We can. Those of us who have battled addiction, we can win those battles. Those of us who have a problem with things like sexual immorality and impurity, it's possible that we can live a life where we're not just cramming that under the rug or in the closet, but we can actually wake up on a day and say, I'm going to start a journey where I deal with that. And I'm a more whole creation in Christ the way God intended me to be. And none of that is meant to be easy, but it's possible. It's possible to be made new. And by the way, none of this is completely up to you as an individual. All of what Paul is talking about here in teaching is all in the context of what? Of the church. We were meant to be in a community where we help each other, all of us, as we live out this new way of being, this renewed mindset in Jesus. You know, the story of Jesus would be actually pretty boring if the whole point was Jesus was perfect, died on a cross, rose from the grave, but that, that was it. If, if all of this was me just telling you about this amazing person who once lived and lives forever, but it actually had no real relevance to our lives, there wouldn't really be much to that message. The whole mentality of God's work is aimed at restoring you, his beautiful creation, and you experiencing that life to the fullest. That's what it's all about. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I love this. Because you know, Paul has laid down the gauntlet. He has challenged us that Christianity is not just some club we belong to, but is very much a complete wholesale life change. And he's named the things that we have to change, and they're hard things. And it's easy for us to say, like, how? Where would we even start? But honestly, it is within a community, is within a church family, where we experience these things, things like compassion, Things like kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. 
forgiveness, all of these things, gratitude. When we live in a community that is defined as these things, how are we not then motivated through the love of Jesus to experience change? In other words, guys, we don't have to go out and advertise and roll out the red carpet with some like messaging of sinners are welcome here. We live that as ambassadors because sinners are welcomed here. Jesus Christ's love is available to all. And we Christians are like the first case subjects in our lives about that. But crucial to that message is sin doesn't define you anymore. Things that define you in this family are that compassion, that peace, that hope, that love. What would it mean to really, truly believe that and then do this, to say yes to that? And I want to challenge you. And this is a challenge to, first and foremost, if, if you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's what you're being, that's what we're inviting you to. We're inviting you to an existence and to a life where you don't have to be as you are any longer. You, you already know things need to be fixed. You're here listening to that message, whether in person or online, because you know something is missing. And that thing that's missing, it's a big thing that's missing. You can't ignore it anymore. And my, my just, I'm so grateful for this. My message to you is there is hope and you can change and you can be made new. And I know that because I'm Jesus's ambassador. I was made new. And I know people in this church and in other churches all over the world that have been made new. And they're doing amazing things, not because we're just awesome people by default. In fact, we're not, but Jesus' love compels us. It has changed us as the same power that rose Jesus from the grave has now made us new. That's what we're inviting you to. Come and be changed. Come and experience newness. Be a new you in Jesus. But this challenge is also to Christians. Christians that may feel very at home in Corinth or Colossae. Christians that may just feel a little complacent in their lives. And yeah, I want to rattle your cages. I want to shake the doldrums. I want you to understand that we are never meant to be stuck in neutral. We are never meant to say, ah, that's just how I am. No, that's how we were. Jesus has absolutely transformed us by reconciling us to God. And now anything is possible. And I don't care what age you are. I don't care where you live, what language you speak. I don't care what your past story was. All God is focused on is your story going forward and how he can use you to transform people for his kingdom. To be a new you. So say yes. I'm encouraging you. I'm challenging you. I'm pleading with you today, right now, to say yes, to say yes to Jesus, to saying yes to the opportunity of being a part of the work that he's doing. And I don't want to just make that like some kind of high spiritual thing, like, oh, I'll say yes, but I'll never actually do something. Like, here's how we do, like, follow through with that. Be in a small group. Serve somewhere in this church. Be on the worship team. Be on the missions team. Next time we hand out school lunches, come down and make a lunch and hand out a school lunch. And, and this is just a handful of ways that people can be involved. There are so many opportunities. Or maybe you see a blind spot that our church is not reaching, and so you need to come and talk to me or come and talk to one of our elders and say, oh man, it wasn't too long ago someone came to me and said, I really want to help out in our kitchen. And I could tell that, man, she was really passionate about this. And she said, I just don't want to step on anybody's toes. You know what I said? Step on toes. Step on toes. Because if we're not doing a good enough job in any ministry of reaching people, then we've got to do a better job. Things can be made new. In other words, say yes. I'm not going to discourage anyone from saying yes. 
And sometimes we need to step on toes. And sometimes we need to come in and learn. We need to come in and, and be taught ourselves and discover and be encouraged. The point is say yes, but then do something with it. And there's so many opportunities. And know that as you say yes, and as you're participating, you're serving, you're serving in a community and in a family where we pride ourselves on things like compassion and forgiveness and peace. These are the hallmarks of the things that draw people to Jesus because these are the things they don't have in their lives. You know, I told you that the last seven things of the dying church, the last seven words are what? We've never done it that way before. And I kind of want to put that in context as we close because I believe where that comes from is a place of, of fear. We're afraid of losing that thing that we might have. And that's always the thing that might prevent us from embracing something different or new. But I'm here to tell you that the more we try to hold on and control our world, the more we come to realize that we never really had control of it in the first place. The only one who really truly has control of all of this is who? It's God. I'd much rather work in concert with what he's doing rather than live in fear of trying to control the elements and the things around me that I never really had control of in the first place. And so if you are a Christian today, and that's been kind of your journey lately, oh, I just got to hold on to this and control it. I'm not here to come down hard on you or to make you feel foolish. I'm actually here to encourage you and uplift you. Maybe you've been one of those seasoned saints that has kept things afloat while we've moved and prodded along. But I want to challenge you as people say yes, as people start coming in, let them serve. Teach them, encourage them, love on them. Let go of that control. Give that back to God and trust and get back to the things which make us great in God's sight, namely being people of compassion, hope, love, forgiveness. The things that changed our lives and made us new that we know are possible in others. Heavenly Father, none of what we've read here is easy, God. It's hard to let go of anger. It's hard to let go of malice and rage. It's hard to let go of lust. It's hard to let go of greed. God, if these things were easy to deal with, then, well, we probably wouldn't need you. But we do need you. That's the whole point. We can't control our world. We need something infinitely greater to compel us forward. And we have that, God. And it's your love. It's a love that's born in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And it's a love that's guaranteed in power by the resurrection. So, Father, remind us today, or for the first time, stir in our hearts the truth that you made us to be new. And that each and every single one of us are capable of so many great things when we say yes to that renewed mindset in Jesus. Help us, your Christians, right here at Dayton Christian Church to be the best ambassadors, the highest ranking ones of people that can offer compassion and forgiveness and hope and peace to a community and to a world that sorely needs it. And Lord, shake us from that well-meaning complacency that keeps us stuck and propel us forward with new hope as we work out this idea of being new creations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
lifting the Lamb of God. And that's the time to do communion, to remember the, what Christ did for us on the cross. We take the bread that he gave his body to us for. And the juice, the blood that he shed for us. And a song I, I heard this week, and it just kind of stuck in my mind. It says, blood ran red, so our sins would turn white. And just think of it, what he gave so we could have eternal life and celebrate it here today. Heavenly Father, I come to you, Lord, and we praise you for what you've done for us, for that time that you spent on the cross and shed your blood that we'd have internal life. Lord, we just thank you for all that you do for us here, for watching over us, and for this communion. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's time that we give our tithes and offerings, something, some of what God has given us, back to him again. We thank you all that, that give for us each week. It keeps this church running and keeps us moving forward. Have a great day. As we prepare to go out and be the church in the world and serve God and uh, be the, the ministry of reconciliation that Josh Tosh talked about this morning, uh, let's worship together one more time. Stand when you get a chance, please. Jake, did my electric die? I'll go to acoustic. Let me try that again. Let's worship.
There are times when I have faltered In those times his love has lifted me Oh, I believe he created me And I will trust his grace has set me free And with my faith, small as a mustard seed chance uh, after service thank Ellie for being the primary lead this morning I think she did great oh, uh, first Peter oh yeah, just the <laughs> grace and peace be yours in abundance have a nice week yeah. God bless you all <laughs>